See, I wonder if nature in this kind of discussion, if nature is a um, catalyst for innovation or if it's a ceiling for innovation. So like, is it going to always limit us? Like uh, the, what you're talking about silicon, is it just make it super easy to do awesome stuff in a certain dimension, but we could still do awesome stuff in other ways, it'll just be harder. Or is it, does it really set like the maximum we can do? There's a that's a good thing to that's a good subject to discuss. I guess I feel like we need to lay a little bit more groundwork. So I want to make sure that um, I introduce this in the context of Lee Smolin's previous idea. If, so who's Lee Smolin and what kind of ideas does he have? Okay, Lee Smolin is a, a theoretical physicist who back in the late 1980s, published a paper in the early 1990s, introduced this idea of cosmological natural selection, which argues that the universe did evolve. So his paper was called, Did the Universe Evolve? Mm -hmm. And I gave myself the liberty of titling my paper, Does Cosmological Selection, or Does Cosmological Evolution Select for Technology? In reference to that. So he introduced that idea decades ago. Now he primarily works on um, quantum gravity, loop quantum gravity, other approaches to um, unifying quantum mechanics with general relativity, as you can read about in his most recent book, I believe, and he's been on your show mm -hmm. as well. So, But I, I want to introduce this idea of cosmological natural selection because I think that is one of the core ideas that could change our understanding of how the universe got here, our role in it, what technology is doing here. But there's a couple more pieces that need to be set up first. So the beginning of our universe is largely accepted to be the Big Bang. And what that means is if you look back in time by looking far away in space, you see that um, everything used to be at, at one point and it expanded away from there. There was a, a era in the evolutionary process of our universe that was called inflation. And this idea was developed primarily by Alan Guth and, and others, Andre Linde and other, others in the 80s. And this idea of inflation is, is basically that when uh, a singularity uh, begins this process uh, of, of growth, there can be a, a temporary stage where it just accelerates incredibly rapidly. And based on quantum field theory, this tells us that this should produce matter in precisely the proportions that we find of hydrogen and helium in the Big Bang, lithium too, lithium also, um, and other things too. So, so the predictions that come out of Big Bang inflationary cosmology have stood up extremely well to empirical verification, the cosmic microwave background, uh, things like this. So most scientists working in the field think that the origin of our universe is the Big Bang. And I, I base all my thinking on that as well. I'm just laying this out there so that people understand that where I'm coming from is an extension, not a replacement of, mm -hmm. of, of existing well-founded ideas. In a paper, I believe it was 1986, with uh, Alan Guth and um, another author, Farhi, they, they wrote that a a Big Bang, I don't remember the exact quote, a Big Bang is inextricably, inextricably linked with a black hole. This singularity that we call our origin is mathematically indistinguishable from a black hole. They're, they're the same thing. And Lee Smolin based his thinking on that idea, I, I believe. I don't mean to speak for him, but this is my reading of it. So what Lee Smolin will say is that a black hole in one universe is a Big Bang in another universe. And this allows us to have progeny, offspring. So uh, a universe can be said to have come before another universe. And very crucially, Smolin argue, argues, I, I think this is potentially one of the great ideas of all time. That's my opinion, mm -hmm. that when a black hole forms, it's not a classical entity, it's a quantum gravitational entity. So there it is subject to the fluctuations that are inherent in quantum mechanics. The, the properties, the, the, what we're calling the parameters that describe the physics of that system are subject to slight mutations so that the offspring universe does not have the exact same parameters defining its physics as its parent universe. They're close, 
but they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a mechanism for evolution, for natural selection. So there's mutation, so there's, and then if you think about the, the DNA of the universe are the basic parameters that govern its laws. Exactly. So, so that, so what Smolin said is our universe results from an evolutionary process that can be traced back some, he estimated 200 million generations. Initially, there was something like a vacuum fluctuation that produced through, through random chance, uh, a, a universe that was able to reproduce just once. So now it had one offspring. And then over time, it was able to make more and more until it evolved into a highly structured universe with a very long lifetime, with a great deal of complexity, and importantly, especially importantly for Lee Smolin, stars. Mm -hmm. Stars make black holes. Therefore, we should expect our universe to be optimized, have its physical parameters optimized to make very large numbers of stars, because that's how you make black holes and black holes make offspring. So we expect our, our the physics of our universe to have evolved to maximize fecundity, the number of offspring. And the way Lee Smolin argues you do that is through stars that the biggest ones die in these core collapse supernova that make a black hole and a, and a child. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I agree with you that this is back to our fractal view of everything from intelligence to our universe. That, that is very compelling and a very powerful idea that um, unites the origin of life and perhaps the origin of ideas and intelligence. So from a Dawkins perspective here on earth, the evolution of those, and then the evolution of the laws of physics that led to us. I mean, it's beautiful. And then you stacking on top of that, that maybe we are one of the offspring Right. Okay. So before getting into where I'd like to take that idea, let me just a little bit more groundwork. There is this concept of the multiverse and it, it can be confusing. Different people use the word multiverse in different ways. In, in the multiverse that I think is relevant to picture when trying to grasp Lee Smolin's idea, essentially every every vacuum fluctuation can be referred to as a universe. It, it, it occurs, it, it borrows energy from the vacuum for some finite amount of time, and it hmm. evanesces back into the quantum vacuum. And ideas of uh, Guth before that and, and Andre Linde with uh, eternal inflation aren't, aren't that different. That You would expect nature, due to the, the quantum properties of the vacuum, which we, we know exist, they're, they're measurable through things like the Casimir effect and others, you know that there are these fluctuations that are occurring. What what Smolin is arguing is that there is this extensive multiverse that we this universe, what we can measure and interact with, is not unique in nature. It's just our residence. It's it's where we reside, and there are countless, potentially infinity, other universes, other entire evolutionary trajectories that have evolved into things like what you were mentioning a second ago with different parameters and different ways of achieving complexity and reproduction and all that stuff. So it's not that the evolutionary process is a funnel towards this endpoint. Not at yeah. all. Just like the, evo the biological evolutionary process that has occurred within our universe is not a unique route toward achieving one specific chosen kind of species. No, we we have a extraordinary diversity around us. That's what evolution does. And for any one species like us, it might feel like we're at the center of yes, this process. Yes. We're the destination of this process, but we're just one of the many uh, nearly infinite branches of exactly. this process. And I suspect it is exactly infinite. I mean, I just can't understand how with this idea, you can never draw a boundary around it and say, no, the un the universe, I mean, the multiverse has 10 to the one quadrillion components, but not infinity. I don't know. that. That's well, yeah, I, I have uh, cognitively in incapable, as I think all of us are, and truly understanding the concept of infinity. And the concept of nothing as well. I, and nothing. Yeah. But also the concept of a lot is pretty difficult. <laughs> I, I could just, I can count, I run out of fingers yeah, at a certain like, point and then you're screwed. And when you're wearing shoes and you can't even get down to your toes, it's like. <laughs> it's like, all right, a thousand, fine, a million. 
is that what? And then it gets crazier and crazier. Right, right. So this particular, so when we say technology, by the way, I mean, there's some, not to over romanticize the thing, but there is some aspect about this branch of ours that allows us to, um, for the universe to know itself. Yes, yes. So to be, to, to have like little conscious cognitive fingers that are able to feel like to scratch the head. Right, right, right. Uh, to, to be able to construct E equals MC squared and to introspect, to, to have to start to gain some understanding of the laws that govern it. Isn't that, um, isn't that kind of uh, amazing? You know, okay, I'm just human, but it feels like that, if I were to build a system that does this kind of thing, that evolves laws of physics, that evolves life, that evolves intelligence, that my goal would be to come up with things that are able to think about itself, right? Aren't we kind of close to this, the, the, the design specs, the destination? We're pretty close, I don't know. I mean, I'm spending my career designing things that I hope will think about themselves. So exactly. maybe you and I aren't too far apart on that one. But then maybe that problem is a lot harder than we imagine. Maybe well, we need to- let's not, get, let's not get too far because I, I wanna emphasize something that what you're saying is, isn't it fascinating that the universe evolved something that can be conscious, reflect on itself? But Lee Smolin's idea didn't take us there, remember? It took us to stars. Lee Smolin has argued, mm -hmm. I think right on almost every single way that cosmological natural selection could lead to a universe with rich structure. And he argued that the structure, the physics of our universe is designed to make a lot of stars so that they can make black holes. But that doesn't explain what we're doing here. You, in, order to, in order for that to be an explanation of us, what you have to assume is that once you made that universe that was capable of producing stars, life, planets, all these other things, we're along for the ride. They got lucky. We're we're kind of arising, growing up in the cracks, but the universe isn't here for us. We're we're still kind of a fluke in that picture. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I I don't I don't necessarily have like a philosophical opposition to that stance. It's just not um okay, so I, I don't think it's complete. So it seems like whatever we got going on here to you, it seems like whatever we have here on earth seems like a thing you might want to select for in this yes, whole big process. Exactly. So if what you are truly, if, if your entire evolutionary process only cares about fecundity, it only cares about making offspring universes because then there's going to be the most of them in that local region of, of hyperspace, which is the set of all possible universes, let's, let's say. Um, you don't care how those universes are made. You know they have to be made by black holes. This is what this is what inflationary theory tells us. The Big Bang tells us that black holes make universes. But what if there was a technological means to make universes? Stars require a ton of matter because they're they're not thinking very carefully about how you make a black hole. They're just using gravity, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but if we devise technologies that can efficiently compress matter into a singularity, mm -hmm. It turns out that if you can compress about 10 kilograms into a very small volume, that will make a black hole that is likely highly probable to inflate into its own offspring universe. Mm -hmm. This is according to calculations done by other people who are professional quantum theorists, quantum field theorists, and I hope I am grasping what they're telling me correctly. I'm yeah. somewhat of a of a translator here. Yeah. But so so that's that's the position that is particularly intriguing to me, which is that what, what might have happened is that, okay, this particular branch on the vast tree of evolution, cosmological evolution now we're talking about, not biological evolution within our universe, but cosmological evolution went through exactly the process that Lee Smolin described, mm -hmm. got to the stage where stars were making lots of black holes but then continued to evolve and somehow bridged that gap and, and made intelligence and intelligence capable of devising technologies because technologies, in, intelligent species working in conjunction with technologies could then produce even more. Yeah, more oxygen. efficiently, more yes. like faster and better yes. and more different. Then you start to have different kind of mechanisms of mutation perhaps, yes. all that kind of stuff. And so if you do a simple calculation that says, all right, if I want to, we know roughly how many 
um, core collapse supernova supernovae have resulted in black holes in our galaxy since the beginning of the universe. And it's something like a billion. So then you would have to estimate that it would be possible for a technological civilization to produce more than a billion black holes with the energy and matter at their disposal. And so one of the calculations in that paper, back of the envelope, but I think revealing nonetheless, is that if you take a relatively um, common asteroid, something that's about a kilometer in diameter, what I'm thinking of is just scrap material laying around in our solar system and break it up into 10 kilogram chunks and turn each of those into a, a universe, then you would have made at least a trillion black holes outpacing the star production rate by some three orders of magnitude. That's one asteroid. So now if you envision an intelligent species that would potentially have been devised initially by humans, but then based on superconducting optoelectronic networks, no doubt, and For they sure. go out and populate, they don't, they don't have to fill the galaxy. They just have to get out to the asteroid belt. They could potentially dramatically outpace the rate at which stars are producing offspring universes. And then wouldn't you expect that that's where we came from instead of a star? Yeah. So you have to somehow become masters of gravity. So like, what or generate- Not necessarily gravity. So stars make black holes with gravity, but any force that can um, make the energy density, can compactify matter to produce a, a great enough energy density can form a singularity. It doesn't, it would not likely be gravity. It's the weakest force. You're more likely to use something like the technologies that we're developing for fusion, for example. So I don't know, um, the large ignition facility recently blasted a pellet with a uh, hundred really bright lasers and caused that to get dense enough to engage in nuclear fusion. So something more like that, or a, or a tokamak with a really hot plasma. I'm not sure. Something, I don't know exactly how it would be done. I do like the idea of that, um, especially just been reading a lot about gravitational waves and you know the fact that us humans with our technological capabilities, one of the most impressive uh, technological accomplishments of human history is LIGO, being able to precisely yeah. detect mm -hmm. gravitational waves. I'm particularly, um, find appealing the idea that other alien civilizations from very far distances communicate uh, with gravity, with gravitational waves, because as you become greater and greater master of gravity, which seems way out of reach for us right now, maybe that seems like a effective way of sending signals, especially if your job is to manufacture black holes. Right. 